All right, I'm going to tie up a zoo cougar. This is without a doubt my most famous streamer. Uh, I still fish this fly a ton, even though I've, I've went to so many articulated flies, but this fly has never lost its fish catching ability. Uh, when you start the thread on this, probably the most common error in fly tying is to rush the head, it's called. You get to the end of the fly and it's like, oh crap, there's nothing left. And you got to try to build the head up or build, make a head that doesn't fall off. And there's a simple way to do that to, to when you first start tying them, or even after you've tied a while. Most really good tires would tell you it takes, I mean, the superstar guys, gals, they'll tell you, you know, they tie two dozen. Normal tires going to be a hundred flies before they totally master it. And one way you can do that is to take an, you know, one you like and just put it up there and look how long the head is. If the head starts right here, if it's a, say it was a, a woolly bugger and the head's there, you don't, don't start your thread at the eye, start it right there where you want the head to begin and you'll never go past that. So you won't run out of space and rush the head. If you're working with hair, I'm going to start the hair, the, the head at about the two thirds point. Now I've done thousands and thousands of these. You know, you can, as you go, you can kind of just work it wherever you want and you'll just know where to start and stop stuff. But it's just a good tip. I've got my thread started right here. I'm never going to get too far and have this little tiny deer hair head. I'm never going to be way back and have a giant one. And just work this back. Um, I'm using GX2 thread or gel spun 200. You can work with even 150, which is a lighter. That's the number of strands. The, uh, the, the number 50, 100, 150, 200 is the number of filaments that's in this thread. It's really thin. I use right bobbins for this stuff because it, I put, you can grab this, you can just turn this stuff, you can bend your hooks. I like a really beefy bobbin when I'm working with this heavier thread. It's really thin, but it's super strong. But on a regular bobbin, you can bend the thing. It'll, you'll just, you'll break them all the time. This is a pretty straightforward fly. I'm going to show you, I always, I'm going to put a tail in here. I'm going to body and underwing and different things. I'm going to show you how I work my materials in, on, in and out of this one. This is, I got a marabou tail. Whenever you work with marabou, it's easier if it's wet and you get it damp and you don't do what I just did. I've been told there's two different carcinogens in this. You know, I'm going to make you do this stuff. Uh, keep a towel here. Just do that. But just make it easier to work with as opposed to this. It's a lot easier to tie that in. It's a lot easier to gauge that than it is that fluffy feather, but you'll figure it out in a hurry if you're working with darker colors. It'll be all over your face, your hands. And, but if you keep a sponge there or something to do that, it'll keep you from growing up like me anyway. You won't have all these ticks. I always, whenever I work with, I just told you when I, when I work with the hook as a gauge, I started my thread here. I do the same thing with all my materials. I, wa I want some reference, something that tells me the tail should be this long or that long or whatever. I always use the hook as the gauge. Put the materials in your right hand, butt the eye of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the materials up against the eye of the hook, and I want it the length of the hook. Pretty straightforward. If you want it shorter, fine. Just make it consistent. Make it so don't, don't have 10 flies with 10 different size tails, because what it's really saying is that you don't have the control over your materials and you're just guessing. So I'm going to butt that up there, switch hands, I'm going to put this in here, and then what I do with my materials on, the, on most of my streamers is I, I start building bulk up the side. All right, I've got the materials and I'm just wrapping on this side, I stop just short of where I started the thread. So I don't, I'm never going to rush this, I'm not going to have, end up with nothing there. And then excuse me, er, stop. I always use two feathers, all right. Now I'm going to take this feather, I'm going to, same thing, you, you, you just butt it the same way. On this one, obviously, it's going to be on top so I can measure off the other feather. So I'm going to set that there. I want to show you something else before I wrap this up here. And I don't worry about, obviously it's a streamer, it's going to go underwater, so I don't worry about bulk so much. 
But uh, this one I'm going to take on the other side. If you notice, the first one I, I just keep grabbing the feather and I'm building a little taper to the body. Again, stopping just short of what there that thread is. And if you see, I've got, I'm, I'm building this wedge. I'm building a taper. I put it up one side, back down the other. Okay, nice and tight. Whenever you finish your fly, whenever you stop with materials, this is, if rushing the head is the number one problem, the number two problem is having an inconsistent spot where you stop your thread. I use the same thing on all my flies. If you look where the, the hook comes around, you'll see where the barb is. And the barb's gouge, it's to stand the, the barb up like this. So you got your hook down here and your barb's swaying up like that. When you let go of your bobbin, that thread should be hanging in the same spot. No matter if you put 15 materials on here, it should always be hanging in the same spot. I like it right where the ascent of the barb starts, right where it starts its curve up. And if you put, you know, I put two different tails on there. I always put two tails on, I like it, a nice thick tail. Then I'm going to take, originally this fly was tied with uh, pearl sparkle braid. I've started using the, the crystal uh, chenilles. This is the, the small. I also dub it. it, do whatever you want, it's just make sure you have a pearl body. All sculpin have a pearl belly. I like this stuff, it's, it builds nice, it's, it's real, it just gives a nice picked out body. On a lot of them I dub them, doesn't matter, whatever, whatever you, whenever I'm doing a seminar or something else, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I know the Thai guys like it to be real specific, you know, indulge yourself, do, do a dub body, do whatever. Originally it was a pearl sparkle braid but uh, and, it, and it's fine I just changed it so again I've tied in this material you see here I've left these threads on the chenille you pick the materials off the chenille so that when you tie it in you're just tying in the threads it's much more secure and then leave it long and just and start your wraps and make sure that you your, your threads right there and then just catch these two little strands nice even wraps come forward Again, I'm using GX2 and GX2 doesn't stretch, so it's, you can't just stop your thread lightly. You've got to make a nice tight stop because it'll try to back off because it doesn't stretch. It's down, it, the upside to that is that it, it's so strong, but the downside is that you can't do an anchor wrap without half hitching. Generally, I'd use my rotary. I'm going to show you something here which just freaked everybody out. I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way because I want to show you something about setting materials on the on your hook. Whenever you use chenille, uh, it's, not as, it's not as stretchy as some of the mylars are, but you can usually stretch them a quarter of their body length, of the, and you want to put the first one in, you go straight away from you, straight away from the hook is your first set, and you hold your tail here, and just tighten it down a little bit, and then the second one, go at an angle, a 30 degree angle, back away from the hook and then watch this I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not I'll get my hand out of the way as far as I can hold your tail so it never spins and you see how I stretch that that's an anchor wrap you, you don't want loose materials on your body if you do you get one hook you know one tooth in the thing and it unravels and you know you don't want to put all this time into it now I've made sure that I've covered that back side up I've got a seriously hard anchor line anchor wrap there and now I go forward, I go one, two, three, four. Every fourth turn, I give it that stretch. It just locks the materials in. I don't have any loose ones, and then I go back at that angle, and I start back again. One, two, three, four. Stretch it. One, two, three, four. And if you're trying to build bulk, you know, you can, you can start, you can go back and forth however you want. You can wrap over top of itself. I just want a slight taper going forward. And every fourth one, I'm going to give it a pull. Just stretch it and go right back over top. I'll end up with a... Oops, fell forward here. Fourth one. You know, you can change the rules as you go if you want to. It's, if it's every fifth one or sixth one for you, it doesn't really matter. It's just the idea is to get in the habit of anchoring your materials down 
so that you never have a fish's tooth come in here and pop that stuff. Now I cut that material, I left about an eighth of an inch, maybe, maybe three sixteenths, and I pulled the materials off so that I've got just those two pieces of the chenille. If you, if you look at chenille, any chenille, I don't care what it is, it's two, it's two fibers, or two threads, I mean, with the fibers, whatever it is, between them. And just pull that off of there so you get really secure. And do the same thing when you finish it. You just pick them off and just pull them out so you can get your next two turns really tight. And you can see there's a little bit of a wedge. We built that with two things. We put the marabou on both sides, and then we just kind of came forward progressively, building a little taper in there. Now we're going to go to the underwing. The underwing really doesn't have much of a function as far as uh, making the fly swim or anything. The idea is with the underwing is it's going to keep the mallard flanks that we're going to put on top stabilized so they won't wrap underneath there. When you work with calf tail, <clears throat> look, I'm going to show you two things about this. The first thing is, is you want to avoid these spins. See how twisted that hair is right there? If you put that twist into the fly, it'll track. It, even though it's not very much of it, it'll still track whatever way that spin is. So when you get up to the front, you know, this is pretty much used up right through here. I've got a little bit left right here that's still good. When you take tail hair, you stand it off to the side like this. It's, it's tapered. When it's up here, the shortest hairs are here and the longest hairs are here. When I stand it off to the side, I can straighten them out, get them closer to the same length. Because I'm not going to stack this hair. So now I've got it off to the side. I've got it doesn't have to be a ton of materials for this, because this is just a stabilizing wing. But there is a there is a secret to it's not a secret, just a, a tip to I'm cleaning this out, just getting the short ones out of here, run it through your comb. When you work with non-compressible hair, there's compressible hair and there's non-compressible hair or hollow and solid. All tail hair is solid. There's no, it's not hollow, and so it doesn't compress well. So when you tie it in, there's a trick to tying it in. If you've ever worked with squirrel tail or bear hair, and you see people tie it in, and they generally cut this at the wrong angle. They cut it back like this, and so your first turn of thread on the, hook, on the materials is the only turn that's on the top one. If one of those hairs falls out, they're solid, so it's a bundle of sticks. One falls out, they all fall out. So we're going to fix that. This tail or this underwing should go back to about the bend of the hook, not all the way back into here. It's just a support. We want a little shorter than the overall length of the fly because you know if you tie it way back here, this hair ends up wrapping around the body. So go right to the bend of the hook, and that's about where you want it. Now instead of tying this like generally you'll see, make sure that's really cleaned. Again, you can't over clean here. It's just just the, the, all those little tiny fibers are the ones we need to have out of there. So we're going to mark it the length we want. And then most of the time people cut it at a 45 going away from the hook. What you're going to do to do it right is you're going to cut it at a 45 in the opposite direction towards the eye of the hook. What that does is it puts the maximum compression on the bottom hair, and this doesn't, so it doesn't have just one turn of thread. It'll have all the turns of thread on here. We're going to take that with a pinch wrap. I've got it set in here. All right, you can see the longest hairs are the top hairs, and then just really reef it down. And with this GX thread, you can. By the way, I'm going to go all the way to the eye now because I know I'm, I'm done. I don't, I don't have to wonder where the head's going to be. I'm going to come back here and we're just going to cinch that down really tight. Now you could pick the fly up by the you could pick the fly up by the collar or the underwing now it's not going to come out. And by the way, glue does not save hair work. If you I don't think people should be able to use glue for 10 years. If if you tie that in wrong and you take a little dab of glue, what you'll end up with is a nice pretty little head and no hair on it anyway. If you do it wrong, it still falls out. So, now we're going to go into the flank feather. This is one of the unique features of this fly. 
there's three things that are going to make this fly swim. What, part of the thing that makes this fly so effective is the way it darts and it always stays level in the water. One of the things that makes that happen is this flank feather. And generally we put two feathers in it, two flanks, and I'm going to show you how to grade them. I've got two feathers here. If you've got, if you're kind of sorting through your feathers and you don't have a ton of really long straight ones, if you're going to have to use two and you've got compromised feathers, the compromised feather or the one that's not quite perfect should be on the bottom. That, because you can draw that one back and hide it a little bit and it's just for stability. What you're looking for ideally is a feather just like that. It's nice and straight, doesn't have a ton of cup in it. They're all going to have this cup right here, but the shaft is super straight. If it's curved, like this one, if it's got a spin to it, that thing will always track on that feather's plane. If it's spun off to the side like that, fly spins over on its side. Totally wasted your time if you do that. So you're looking for nice, straight shafts and long enough to cover all the way to the back of the hook, back of the tail, excuse me. So I generally take the materials, strip the sides. I don't want to get this crap in here. I want it to be nice and clean so I can see what's going on. And then I match them in right now. Some people tie the one end first, then the other one. I generally just match them. Once you get them set and married together, uh, whenever you put a feather on like that, it's called marrying the feather. Make sure they're the same length if they're long enough. If, they're, if you're using the short one, like I was saying a minute ago, and you're going to tie it in first, if it's kind of compromised, it's not real full like that one is, like this one here is, you tie this one in short, and then you'll cover over top of it. These are pretty clean. They're both, obviously I picked good ones so that nobody would see a bad fly on film, but match these up or marry them. The shafts on mallard flanks are really flat, so they lay down really nicely on top of the hook. And now I'm just going to put this feather on here. I'm going to kind of gauge it. It's still pretty long. Should just keep stripping that off until it's pretty close. And then what I do is I set them on top, right on top, and I do one kind of tight two a little tighter and then just hang it over the top there. Now look right down on top of the feather. Get right over top of them and turn the vise to me. And I look right down on top, make sure they're both nice and flat. I want the tip of this mallard flank to go just, just slightly longer than the tail. Once you're safe that you know everything's on top, then just make sure the feather stays there. And then just come forward four or five wraps right here. Pull those off and go right back to where you're going to start your collar. Now, ideally, right now, when you look over top of this feather, it's the shaft of the feather is right down the shank of the hook, right down over top of it. Not off, if it's off to one side, I guarantee your fly is going to constantly do this. All right, so one of the most ugly parts of seeing poorly tied flies is really wimpy little collars. You want a really beefy collar and that's the second thing that makes this fly stay where it is. The collar is really designed to be the pectoral fins on the fly. If it's really wimpy, you know, there's just a few hairs here and there. One, it says that you didn't know how to do it and two, it won't stabilize the fly. One of the keys to that is knowing how to pick hair and it's, it's as much tactile as it is visual. You can feel really good hair and you can almost hear it. It's coarse. If you can hear it's coarse when you feel it like that. But you can close your eyes and just go like that and you'll feel this coarsity. All right. What that's telling you, and I think we can pick this up. I've got different colors here in case we can't. But what you're looking for ideally is to see I'll get the scissors here. First and foremost, you're always looking for this color break up here where the dark line and the light meets right here. And you want the furthest you can get, the most distance between that line and the skin. 
because it's working material. That's all hollow hair from here down. Everything above there is solid. All right, so first thing you're looking for is that, a nice clean break. The clean break telling you that the hair is nice and straight. You can see it. you don't want any curves in the hair. You don't want any cowlicks in there. The second thing you're looking for is this little wrinkle that's in here. It's just really wrinkly hair. What that's telling you that it's, and you want to see it. It's very coarse, it's nice and hollow, it's going to flare nice. And the last thing you're looking for is not to see a bunch of fur. See how clean this piece is right here? Super clean, no fur in it. And we've already looked at that one's got the nice clean break. When you look at this hair, you'll see this fuzz in the side. See how I just reached in there and picked that out? What that's telling you is you're getting a really late season deer. This is late winter deer. It's not really quality. You're not getting this clean break up here anymore. And you're not getting the wave to the hair. The fur is starting to fill in. And this is, I mean, this is almost, I don't know if you can hear that or not. I'm putting it close to the mic. It's not as coarse when you hear it. When you pick these two pieces up and you go like this and you just feel your hand on them, the old hair or the later season hair will sound um, it'll feel oily, it will feel smoother, and the good hair will feel coarse in your hand. So just as a kind of quick review, when you're looking, and you really have to pick the hair when you go into a fly shop. I mean, if you just take any piece of hair, like you pick this one up, these are all the same quality, these are all called Primo strips. This hair is total junk. I mean, I send these back, I, I wouldn't even work with this. There's no break in it whatsoever. It's, it, this hair is really past its prime. There's not any even length to it. You can't see a break in it anywhere. This hair is worthless for most all practical purposes. Conversely, the same shipment, this one comes in, it's perfect. All right? It's just you got to go and touch it and feel it. If you look at this one, it's really smooth. This is almost silky smooth. It's terrible hair. You can see it. There's no... There's no wrinkle to it. It's super skinny. It's going to be really hard to work with. This one, on the other hand, is perfect. Good black line right there. Lots of length. Inch and a half, about perfect. Inch, inch and a half. Inch and a half to two inches is perfect. You start getting into an inch, and it's a little hard to work with. So critical. Now, I'm going to take this hair. I'm going to cut. I just established that the, the worst thing we can possibly do is have a wimpy collar. So I'm going to take a relatively beefy sized piece of hair. I don't want, this is just the collar. There's some freak of nature that says whenever you tie in a collar, your first spin, it's perfect. So we're going to have to start with more than we wanted. So this is what I wanted to show you. That's two pulls on the hair. This is what has to come out, all right? You can see how thick that is. Look at all that crap in there. There's no way to get this tied around that hook and make it perfect for our first spin if this is all inside here. And then the fly is going to be weak and fall apart anyway. So that was the first pull, one, two, pretty clean. And by the way, that was on a really good piece of hair. <laughs> you know, it has, to, it, it has to have itself cleaned out. You always spin it by the tips, do your final pull, take your stacker, put it in here. Now, back to that freak of nature. Whenever people tie in collars, it seems like the first time they put it in, it spins perfectly and they get this beautiful head, everything's great with the world, but they got this hair sticking out here and it's so good they want to use it. So we're going to eliminate that possibility. But just real quickly, I want to show you something. Forget these parts of the scissors are down here. Just look at the tips. When you put hair in here, on, what the idea is, is that you, when you spin hair or stack hair, you wrap thread around it, and it's laying flat. And then you tighten the thread down, and you make this V. It's called flaring. It sticks up, and it's got this nice 45-degree angle like that. If you try to use that hair from the collar as part of the head, you're going to ask it to lay back like this, and then as soon as you let go, it's going to always want to go forward. It's always going to want to go back where it belongs. 
and then you finish your head, you do the rest of these steps that we're going to do, and then you go back in and trim it, and there's this collar, and then there's this wedge, and there's an air gap between your head and the collar. We're going to eliminate that possibility, because it really looks bad, and it tell, it's telling you that you aren't doing your material, you're not applying your materials right. Stack your hair. If you want to, clean it again. Now, I like the hair, the collar to be about a third of the length of the hook, third to a quarter. Just bump it up like that. And now it's going to get a little tricky because we've got a lot of hair here. So check it. Make sure it's at least a quarter of the length of the hook. We're going to transfer it to our left hand. And because we know the first one's going to be perfect, it's going to have this beautiful flare, we're going to eliminate all possibilities of wanting to use this by simply cutting that hair off. Now I have a little tiny piece of hair in my left hand. I don't want it to be moving around. And I'm going to set it on top. And by the way, this is how you tie the perfect elk hair caddis. You'll see what I mean in a second if you're doing a dry fly. So you take this and you, you set your thumb and your forefinger, your pinch wrap right here, and you, you take one turn, about an eighth of an inch of hair showing forward. Take one turn, pull it just a little tight so your thread disappears. Okay, just tight. Second wrap, just a little bit tighter. You're just barely tightening it down. Okay, third wrap. Before you do anything, you reach over and you just push your thumb down like that and then tighten it. Can you see what a perfect little elk hair caddis head that is? It, you never have to get in here and do this stuff, and you don't have the idea that you're going to use that hair that was out here as part of the head. Now you've got a perfect collar. If you've done it right, if you've done it right, when you flip it over, you should see a totally clean underside. You only want this to be a starburst half, halfway around the hook. You put, your, you put your two or three wraps on there, you pushed your thumb into it, it's all down to the side. Now you go right through and you just catch those hairs. So now you have an absolutely bulletproof, huge, thick collar. But it could never pull out. It's not on the bottom. You're not disturbing the bottom of the hook so you, don't, you can still see the, the pearl belly. So now what we're going to do is we're going to spin this hair. So we're going to go through the same thing, but you're going to have to listen to something else. I'm going to get, you thought it was bad before. It gets worse. Here's the hair again. So I'm going to set this aside just for a second. I need a piece of black hair. I want to show you something. I'm going to put another color hair in here, not for decoration. I just want you to understand how there, there seems to be a lot of mystery behind spinning deer hair, and it really shouldn't be. It's so simple. But you have to understand that it, the hair has to, to do something, and you have to make it do that. I'm going to put two and a half wraps of thread around this hair. It's going to be a big bundle of hair. And then I'm going to, the second one, and then I'm going to pull straight down. The idea is that you're going to start with this bundle of hair like this with thread wrapped around it. And you want the thread to tighten down so close around the hook shank that it flares in 45s on both ends. So ideally, you put two and a half turns and you pull it. If you can make the hair go around one complete revolution, that's one turn of thread left on the hook. That means it's tightened down so tight around the hook that it can't fall out and it's got a perfect flare to it. So to show you that, what I'm going to do, you don't stack, you don't have to stack that here. I'm just doing it so I've got some place to put it. I'm going to take this little dark brown, it's not black, you didn't see any black sitting there. So I'm going to take this little piece of brown hair and I'm just putting this in here to show you for an example. I'm going to come forward just slightly in front of the collar, because that hair is going to go back there. I'm going to pull this hair out. I need a little bit. I like to use a lot of hair when I spin it. 
didn't have quite enough. I'm not worried about the bundle so much. I don't have to don't have to stack it because it's all going to get flared and cut off. But I'm going to take this piece of brown hair and I've put it right on top of the the other bundle. Makes kind of a cool little dot also, but that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it just so you can see what I'm talking about. So then I take this hair, and this is why, by the way, why you want that distance between that dark line in the upper hair and the skin. We want this length of this hair so we've got something to work with. So now I'm going to go, kind of got out of control here. Now I'm going to have this brown hair right on top, and I went one. Now you can see it's the thread starting to disappear. I've got one turn of thread. Now I go right over top of the other turn and I pull it <clears throat> tighter again. What I'm trying to do is make the thread disappear and work the hair down around all the way around the hook. I'm letting it kind of move. I still have it in my left hand and I'm pulling it here and there's my half turn. Now the hair's on top of the hook right now. So I'm going to pull it straight down at me I'm not going to continue wrapping around. I've got two and a half turns of thread on here. This hair on the top now has got to come around and you see it went one complete revolution. All right, I now have one turn of thread, one and a half, the back one's just hanging here. But it went completely around. You see it's right back on top. That tells me it's spun. My thread has cinched down as tight as possible and I've got this, I can pull this until I break the the hair, you know, it's, and you can see it's got this perfect starburst. It's nice and just fluffed out. But you see how it went all the way around? I, I can pull this thing. I'm bending the hook. It's not spinning. I had total control over the hair. Now you come through, just kind of try not to trap any other hair. Just get in there. Generally, on my working flies, I, what I do is I, I would have one spin of hair just like I've got there. But I'm just going to show you real quick how to put the second piece in there. On my, on my flies, on my working flies, not something I was doing for decoration or somebody to put in a shadow box, I'd be done. I, I don't want a heavily packed head. If you, you see people packing the heads there, they take the, the materials and they push it back like this. And what it's it's called packing. You can use there's packing tools. Uh, you'll see them on the end of you know half hitch tools, and they've got specific tools. You see people just using ink pens and shoving this back. That's great if you want a really tight head. But what that does is it makes it a popper, and so it won't go under water. I want it loose. I want it to absorb water, and just you know I want it to when I cast it. I want it to jettison its water quickly out of the head. But I also want it to hit the water and absorb water quickly because I'm not trying to make it float. So your second spin. You put this spin off to, at a 45 degree angle, get the hair out of the way. The reason you do that is so that you can see at an angle. It's so you can see you're not trapping these hairs back here. Every progressive wrap forward, you don't want to catch these with your thread like that. So you set your finger here, you set it at a 45 degree angle. Just do one, two, and a half. Went around once, I'm clean. Now come through the hair again. Just get it off to the side so you're not trapping any hairs. If you trap hairs with your thread when you go in and two things can happen. One, it'll look like crap. Two, when you go in to do what we're going to do next, if it's on top of that hair, that if you've caught some of them, when you go in with your razor blade, you can uh, cut it off cut the whole thing off. So now we got this nice big fluffy ball of hair. What we're going to do is take a double edged razor blade. You get about five, six flies to a blade to a side and before it gets dull. You can't, you can't, once they're dull, they're dull. If you're smart, you go to the dollar store, you can find these. They're getting hard to find. People don't shave with this stuff anymore. But it, be careful with it. Nobody has to have you heard told that, but be careful with this. And one of the ways that you can be careful with the blade is that 
don't try to work it like this. Put the blade, the first cut we're going to do is the bottom cut, and we're going to suspend our hand with our, our right hand in our left hand like this, and put your hand somewhere where you can stabilize it over here. And that way you're not kind of fumbling around here, and you're nice and, nice and secure. The bottom, I told you before, the flank's the first part, the, the collar's the second part, and the third part of the stabilization of this fly is this how you cut the bottom of the head. The head should be totally flat. Take your blade, and you're going to run it at a 45 degree angle. You're going to draw it at you, and just put your hand, your right hand on the tips of your left fingers here, and then just come in and do one cut, just like that. Should be nice and flat now. Now you take the blade, you bend it at the, the curve like this. I don't know how to tell you what curve that is. It's just you figure it out, what, what shape you like. So then come right over top, look over top of your hook, come over top and just push right into the fly. One, two, and you go right into your collar. At this point, you're almost done. Take the fly out. I put it right away from me. I go like this, one up, and I always go up the hair. The reason you use a blade is it cuts the hair at an angle, so you want to continue that angle with your scissors. So you go up, and you're just getting symmetry here. You just want it the same on both sides. Take your collar out, you still got a nice full collar, and just clean it up. If that was a working fly, I can guarantee you I'd have been done in 10 seconds. I wouldn't sit here and pick away and grab these little sides off. The key here is to just look at it, put it back in the vise here so you can see it easy. What I want, I don't want a real thick, you know, packed head. I want it nice and loose so when you touch it, it's loose here. And what ideally what you've ended up with, what we were talking about not using the collar here, is that the head is going into the collar like that. There's no gaps. And there's a shape. Everybody's shape is different. I, I like a, a kind of a, a wedge up here. I like it, you know, you can just look at it. I don't know how to even describe it. That's the shape I like. But key things here, bottom's flat, nice thick collar, and the head's not really thick and hard packed. That's the Zoo Cougar. This is still one of my favorite flies on earth.